uh, continuing with our uh, mega trends of the religious world, 10 mega trends. And uh, uh, we've been uh, taking various subjects a week at a time. Each of these you could go on two, three, four weeks with ease, but uh, we're just doing uh, one Sunday at a time to move through fast. And uh, our key text is 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, which is a prophecy of the Apostle Paul of the last days. I want somebody to get that for me, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. Dave Burke, then I want somebody to get for me, 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 15 is uh, Samantha. So uh, there's been a radical shift uh, in uh, the uh, society action in the last 50 years, a radical, radical shift. Uh, there are words that are very prominent now called gender equality, uh, women's liberation, patriarchy, equal rights, and all of these words are words that we have uh, uh, come to hear and uh, have made their, uh, their way to the forefront. And uh, as a result of all of this, uh, there are women in the military, uh, we have women in pastor roles in uh, many churches, and uh, these have caused a complete reversal of the traditional roles in the home, the family, the church, and in society. And uh, we want to uh, uh, deal this morning with women in ministry and emphasis on women's ministries. This is uh, one of the things the Lord spoke to me that we have to confront. We're dealing with it, and uh, this has come mainstream uh, in our generation. And I want to read, first of all, a prophecy, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, if I could have that in a loud, clear voice. This is the Apostle Paul. Now, think about this for a moment, because he's going to describe uh, some things here that you could pick up your newspaper and you could uh, readily identify. And uh, he's going to name a number of trends uh, some of you are having to deal with in your homes, in your schools. Uh, on your jobs, you're having to deal with exactly what he's talking about here. And so we know that the Apostle Paul was right on. Second Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last way. Okay, this is the Apostle Paul, King James Version. Jerusalem Bible says you may be quite sure that in the last days there are going to be some difficult times. People will be self-centered and grasping, boastful, arrogant, and rude, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, irreligious, heartless, and uh, unappeasable. They will be slanders, profligates, savages, and enemies of everything that is good. They will be treacherous and reckless and demented by pride, preferring their own pleasure to God. They will keep up the outward appearance of religion, but will have rejected the inner power of it, have nothing to do with people like that. I was thinking as he was reading that, I, there's a, an article on the Arizona Republic this morning on the business page, and uh, it drew my attention. And there's an astonishing number of uh, young people that are uh, just uh, in college, just graduating. They expect to be, they fully expect to be millionaires in their 20s. <laughs> Lots of luck. And there are. I've, I've got an article, I think it's in Inside Magazine, that here's a 19-year-old, he's already a millionaire, he created a website, etc., etc. But uh, those are flukes in society, and uh, most people are going to work for a living all their life. But, you see, this is the generation that has, has been cultured to expect everything and to have uh, uh, not prepare for any reversal. So uh, here we have this social thing, and I want to uh, uh, have 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 15, and our uh, session this morning is going to be Women in Ministry and Emphasis on Women's Ministries. If you read that for me, 1 Timothy 2, uh, 9 through 15 out loud. Okay, I want three scriptures. I want uh, Matthew twenty four thirty seven in this section right here. Somebody help me is uh, Jacob. I want uh, uh, Pete Genesis six five and six. I want Genesis six eleven and twelve. Somebody help me with that is Bill Brunson. So uh, we have uh, this morning. You will have to admit we have chaos in society. If you disagree with that, why well, you need to be examined by somebody. Uh, we have tremendous social disintegration. What we're experiencing in America is a social disintegration. We live in uh, Prescott, Arizona. This is a nice little redneck community. Uh, and uh, it uh, is a part of America 
uh, the heart of America, what America is made up of. But uh, we're quite sheltered here from the rest of the world, and yet not completely sheltered, because many of you are experiencing some of the social chaos as far as children, uh, schools, uh, society, uh, attitudes, uh, uh, and uh, the trends in the world. We're experiencing that right now. So Matthew 24, uh, 37. As the days of Noah was, so shall the days of the coming of the Son of Man. So this means something. This is uh, the, our Lord Jesus Christ. He is projecting ahead 2,000 years, and uh, he is talking about the uh, second coming uh, when he is to complete uh, God's time segment uh, for this year. How many of you doubt that this is the last days? Anybody doubt this is the last days? I don't think there's anybody here, even sinners, know that, uh, that we're winding down to something cataclysmic and chaotic. Uh, Genesis 6, 5 and 6. Okay. Uh, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was only evil continually. He looked upon his creation, and there's been such a disintegration of uh, social mores, morals, attitudes, uh, actions, uh, that uh, he sees this uh, and he makes a comment of it. Genesis 6, 11, and 12. The earth also was corrupt before God. The earth was corrupt before God. The earth was filled with violence. And the earth was filled with violence. Does anybody uh, think there's any violence in the earth today? Go ahead. All flesh has corrupted its uh, way upon the earth. So uh, here's the prophecy then. Uh, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. I just finished uh, reading a, a very interesting book. It's not a Christian book at all. It's written uh, by the son of one of the men who were made famous by the raising of the a flag on Iwo Jima, on Mount Suribachi. And as I was reading that, uh, he goes back into their uh, lives uh, prior to World War II, and, and immediately... Imagery came to my mind of my boyhood in Prescott, Arizona. Uh, Prescott, Arizona was a totally different place to live in 1935, 38, 38, and 9, and 40. I still remember on the Sunday uh, that the Japanese bomb uh, Pearl Harbor, I was 11 years old, uh, on a Sunday afternoon, my father came out and announced to me the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. It meant nothing to me. I'm, I'm, I'm crawling around on hands and knees following ants around to see what ants do in holes. I'm, I'm uh, building little dams. I'm building tree houses. I'm, uh, I'm talking Prescott, Arizona was a little town of about 3,500 people, and it was a pastoral life, and life was so different in, in those days than it is today. And a fit of nostalgia came over me as I was reading this book and thinking about the tremendous change that there's been in society uh, in, uh, in those days. So what we have today, uh, we pick up our newspaper and we have drive-by shootings daily. Isn't this correct? I remember one of the greatest events that, that happened in Prescott, Arizona was uh, one of the Matley boys went up in the uh, St. Michael Hotel and shot a guy with a 30-30 because he was messing with his girlfriend. And uh, this trial, I mean, this was the, the greatest happening that ever happened in Prescott, Arizona. The courthouse was packed. I mean, this was an event. Today, you probably wouldn't get 10 people that would have, because these, this is common. People are killed all the time. This has become a part of society. Uh, children uh, today become cold-blooded murderers. Uh, Brother Noel Tossing, as is, uh, is, is, is he gives his reports, of going into these prisons in these places, he's, he's shocked by it. He's astonished. Here's these little kids. These are just little kids. They're cold-blooded murderers. Murder somebody without a twinge of conscience. Think nothing more about it. This is the society in which we live. Teen pregnancy is rampant. You are aware of that. Illegitimacy. Uh, babies out of wedlock. This has just become the run of the hour, uh, and this has become a part of our society. What we're dealing with is a breakdown of the home and the family. Now, I want to lock this in on your minds for a moment. Uh, divorce uh, is, uh, 
has become so devastating that even secular officials are talking about a drastic step of some kind to make it more difficult to dissolve a marriage. Because even secular officials are seeing the destruction of the home and the ease with which uh, marriages are dissolved and children are left in chaos. Uh, and we have uh, ADD, uh, AH. ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactive Disorder, or ADD, which is actually ab Absent Dad Disorder. That's what the problem is. Ritalin uh, is being passed out uh, in the school. Psychiatric profession is uh, recommending that uh, probably four out of five children get shot up with Ritalin of some kind and uh, take these mind-altering drugs. And so what we're seeing is the chaos in society. Now remember, Paul prophesied, Jesus prophesied, uh, and so I have a question to you, uh, to put to you. And so has suddenly some uncontrollable, some uncontrollable force seized society and has suddenly shattered society. What's bringing this to pass? Why are we dealing with the uh, statistics we're dealing with, the issues we're dealing with, uh, has uh, some uh, irresistible uh, force uh, hijacked society and suddenly have it off in, into, a, uh, into a, uh, a chaos that it's in? Well, I think that we're going to find this morning at least uh, very uh, uh, deep uh, uh, things that are going to bring this to uh, to us, and we're going to open for discussion in a moment. There's been a sea change in in gender roles. There's been a traumatic shift in one generation. That generation has to do with the, the issue that we're dealing with. I remember as a young boy, uh, my family moved here in the Depression. Uh, we moved here from Arkansas. Uh, we uh, settled in the slums of uh, of uh, Forbing Park. Because that's what uh, that's what began for being Parkers, Arkies and Okies. They moved out and had little shacks out there, and uh, that was the slums of Prescott, for being Park. So uh, Ed, you're living out in slums now. Amen. <laughs> And so uh, my family uh, disintegrated. It's about 1935. My mother divorced my father, which was absolutely almost unheard of in those days. My mother. Uh, 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 my, uh, my father was a star route ca contractor. He at one time uh, had uh, the star route, uh, which is a rural mail carry between uh, little cities, between uh, Prescott and Bumblebee, Phoenix to Bumblebee, and Prescott to Clemensaw. He, uh, he owned all of those. He was a contractor. And my mother uh, ran the mail route from Phoenix. She lived in Phoenix. Uh, she ran the mail route from Phoenix to Bumblebee. A woman... Uh, uh, and that kind of occupation, driving every day, was absolutely, uh, it's like somebody landed from outer space. Okay, now, you women's liberty, don't get mad at me. Just stay with me till I get through. <laughs> I can already feel this verbally. Okay? Uh, this is probably 1938. Uh, then came World War II. Uh, World War II. America uh, cranked up uh, every, every faculty, every facility, every factory, uh, every family was involved, and uh, every uh, able-bodied man was sent off to war, and uh, women then, big time, came into the workforce. Uh, the, you heard uh, uh, in the defense industry, every uh, uh, defense plant cranked up. Uh, Rosie the Riveter, you've uh, heard that cliché. Uh, women went to work in defense plants, which is absolutely uh, unheard of in America. This is uh, women, some women did uh, work and have uh, various kinds of positions, but very, very few. Uh, suddenly, there was a sea change in how America uh, functioned and how America uh, 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 carried itself. And every uh, segment of society uh, began to feel the impact of this sea change in the gender roles in a, in a generation, and uh, every segment of society now has been permeated by that sea chain of mentality, uh, and by the women's liberation movement this morning, it's almost a compulsion that women have today to prove an ability, uh, the ability they have. I can do anything. You can do better. I can do anything better than you. Have you ever heard that little ditty? That's sung by lots of women proudly, almost as a, an agenda that uh, suddenly there is this motivation, and this motivation is to prove that they can do anything that a man can do, and as a matter of fact, uh, they can uh, do it better. 
And so now what's happening, this has now infiltrated the church, which was the last frontier. Now, the reason it was the last frontier is because of the scripture that I read to you, because of uh, the deep convictions of, uh, of uh, the churches through the centuries that the Bible meant what it said, and they would not allow uh, women to step across uh, this border in ministry as far as being priests, as far as being leaders, as far as being preachers and pastors. It was only those that are outside the mainstream that had this mentality, but this has now invaded the church. I have a, an article, and uh, this article is entitled, entitled, Ten Lies the Church Tells Women. This uh, article is, came out of a, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, a little magazine that Phil got for me. At, uh, I'm trying to think of the name, but it's J. Lee Grady, who's the author, uh, who's the editor of Charisma Magazine. And uh, Spirit Led Women, that was the little, the little article. I read this. As I read this, uh, every single thing that we believe and practice in the church, uh, he assaults. Ten lies that the church tells women. I read that and I said, no problem. No, no wonder to me we got problems in the church with uh, editors like that uh, writing insane stuff. It isn't biblical. He comes to uh, presumptions. He says, well, the Apostle Paul probably meant this. Well, uh, I think the Apostle Paul probably knew what he was talking about when he wrote. How many of you believe that? Uh, we uh, live our lives by what the Apostle Paul wrote, and so uh, we're going to examine some of that in a moment. And so I got magazines, I get mailings of women's conferences. They're nonstop. Uh, one issue of Charisma Magazine had five different women's conferences. These are full-bore women's conferences for the uh, purpose of women's ministries, focusing on uh, women's ministries. And uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the trend is uh, co-pastoring. Pastor and Mrs. W. Mitchell. Wouldn't you love that? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so, uh, two mailings that I've just gotten the last month. Winds of Harvest, Extravagant Grace, uh, and so on and so forth. I want to read you a couple of quotes. This will uh, help us uh, uh, home in before we get into the Scripture. Uh, I read this in, uh, in last Sunday, but I want to share it again. Uh, uh, this is a quote from a pastor. He preached a sermon on uh, uh, something. I don't know, but he's telling me about this quote. I said, I want that quote. He says, the invisible man has been created in many ways by the feminist movement. Women with their equal pay and sexual liberation think they have it all. Women didn't realize that they had it all before. In their pre-liberation chastity and modesty, they held the keys to power. Men had two choices, marry or end up like Charlie Sheen. Now men are non-paying Charlie Sheen's because women give it away for free, all while reading stories uh, such as 10 Get Him to Commit Clues or How to Make Any Guy Beg for You. And in her book, What Our Mothers Didn't Tell Us, Danielle Crittenden documents the absent male commitment and offers the chilling words of a female college student. All men want to do is hook up. They don't even bother to call you in the morning. Fuller is as clueless as her magazine story titles, Women are desperately seeking what our mothers once had, the power of restraint and the self-assurance of selflessness. Today, the women's movement has left women still the prey, but added the responsibilities of huntress. They have the right to read and worry about tightening their buttocks while trying to figure out how to swing a mortgage. They read up on how to get a guy to commit while the guys are off enjoying themselves, because what guys want now comes without the bounds of matrimony. Men have women with bipolar disorders who are self-supporting thanks to equal rights and commitment-proof thanks uh, to abortion on demand, which gives men an ideal world. All the perks, no costs, Dutch treat all the way. Men could not have come up with a better result had they designed the women's movement themselves. That's a profound statement, and yet that is true. Uh, the Baptist, in 1998, uh, this is a Southern Baptist, they came up with a, uh, a, an exhortation uh, and a statement out of their annual convention, and the, the statement said that they exhorted wives to submit graciously to their servant leadership of their husbands. You would have thought that they said, let's molest women on the courthouse steps. I mean, the media just came unglued that they would even think of putting what the Bible says uh, out as a public statement. This year, they met together. Now, remember, these people are acting because of what they see happening. 
This is not some, uh, they have bad dreams from pizza. And so they said, you know what, let's see if we can hurt some women. Uh, we hate women, so let's, let's, let's see if we can hurt some women. They saw what was happening, and as they saw what was happening, they made a decision this year, and they put out that the office of pastor is limited to men as qualified by Scripture. It all began again. I mean, an upheaval, uh, as if you had uh, brought some kind of doctrine in uh, from outer space. So the general effect of this is the invisible man. This is what's happening. See, you folks, you've heard me say before, as you're in this congregation, look around, see how many men you see. Look around to the side. I want you to look and see how many men you see. That is a rarity. That did not happen accidentally. And any of these people who have been to and attended other fellowships will readily testify that that is so. The majority of these assemblies, these groups are heavily women populated. Why? Why is that? Has all of a sudden men, they developed a gene of some kind? And so here's Jesus. He, speak, he picks 12 men. And uh, he, they're women. They are supporters. They are valuable parts of their uh, enterprise. Uh, the Apostle Paul writes uh, uh, graciously about them. He word, writes words of appreciation. But why suddenly have men disappeared from the church scene? Is it that through the, the years they've evolved and this gene suddenly has popped up and this gene says, don't go to church? I don't think so. I think the reason is exactly what we're going to deal with this morning and it has to do with our approach. And what is happening is that the devil has very, very subtly invaded and he's taken the cutting edge off of, uh, and the cutting edge is gone off of manhood in the church. And in society, let me let me read you this little article. Here's a here's a uh, a great little article, and this article is entitled "Love Your Nails, Jack." <laughs> Isn't easy being hip now that male earrings are everywhere. Guys are turning to fingertip art. <laughs> By nothing else or less than the director of the nail polish company. Urban decay. Now that tells you a lot about where we're going. See, this is a generation that if you if you uh, if you design something nasty, right on the fringe of blasphemy, uh, make it uh, irreligious, rebellious, and if you can market it and peddle it, they buy it. So they named this company Urban Decay. Well, that's right on. This is the director of that. And so it says, with earrings now dangling from the lobes of stockbrokers, bartenders, and truck drivers, what's a hip guy to do to distinguish himself? Well, for starters, he could paint his fingernails olive, khaki, and black. <laughs> Such celebrity hipsters as director Quentin Tarantino, Dennis Rodman, and rocker Lenny Kravitz have painted their nails for years. So faggots paint their nails and we should paint ours. <laughs> but now nine-year-old boys are showing up at nail polish parties in Dallas and Los Angeles. High school coaches from Orinda, California to North Stamford, Connecticut have ordered dozens of bottles in school colors for fo football players to wear on game day. Young people in the 1990s are not as scared about issues of sexual orientation, says Chicago hairdresser James Braun, 20. The younger crowd thinks it's stupid that only women can wear skirts and nail polish. Hey, right on. You want silk panties? We can get some silk panties for you. Too. <laughs> that was clipped out of, uh, what is it, Newsweek or Time? Time. Magazine. Wonderful American uh, propaganda organ. I have another article. I won't bother. This is gender chameleons. Popular fashion, uh, fascination with an, an androgyny gives the phrase boy meets girl an entirely new meaning. In other words, you're not sure what you're dating. There's three books. Uh, one of these is called The Church Impotent. Uh, we have various issues that are floating in out of the library of the church by Leon Puddles. The Pauline Doctrine of Male Headship, this also is in our uh, library. 
uh, uh, written by a Presbyterian pastor up in uh, Portland, Oregon. And Leadership is Male, uh, which is another one I have uh, that is printed in England. And so what, we've, what we have discovered, and the reason these three books were written is uh, the same reason that the Baptist uh, passed these two uh, uh, ordinances uh, is because they saw the disintegration of society that had invaded the Southern Baptist churches, and they saw they're going to have to make a stand uh, or they're going to lose totally the gist of what they are and where they're headed. And they saw the feminization of Christianity. I want to read to you. This is an article out of uh, uh, the church impotent, the uh, uh, feminization of Christianity. Let me just share a couple of uh, statements. Bernard of Clairvaux used erotic language to describe the relationship of the soul to God, and this has had great appeal to women. Bernard referred to himself as a woman. You don't have to guess at his sexual orientation, do you? Catholic priest. Bernard referred to himself as a woman and advised his fellow monks to consider themselves as mothers. As a result, men exited the church in growing numbers. Bridal mysticism also infected Protestantism, including the Puritans. Jonathan Edwards, for example, preached to young women that Christ would be their lover, yea, he will be your glorious bridegroom. The trend continues today with leaders like Bill McCartney of Promise Keepers telling men we were created to be in a love affair with Jesus. What is lacking in the church, says the author, is a language of intimacy that expresses the closeness that men feel with men. Uh, Potals concludes by observing that men will not stay long in a feminized church or one that promotes toleration of homosexuality. Okay, here we have. And so uh, you, uh, in, in this generation, what you're, uh, what you're hearing as a direct result of what we're talking about are terms like, uh, let's make love to Jesus. See, that's under sexual overtone. That is not Bible, and this is exactly what we're talking about. And men will not stay in that kind of thing. I said men won't. Wimps will. Men won't. Okay. So uh, uh, let me read you a couple more things, and we're going to open in, in a moment. Uh, this is a little statistic. It says uh, only a small increase in the proportion of men who are born again was recorded between 1990 and 2000. Half that noted among women. Church attendance, Sunday school attendance, and church volunteerism by men actually dropped in the last decade, according to the, uh, the Barner Research Group random study of 1,000 uh, people, so uh, I want to uh, for a moment. I want to get some scripture. Let's go back again to First Timothy two nine through fifteen. Uh, the person who had that before, I want you to read it. Was it Dave? If you had uh, whoever that was, or Samantha? I want First Corinthians fourteen thirty four and thirty five. Somebody over here, uh, uh, Don. I want Titus two three through five as Pete Baker, and I want First uh, Peter three five and six as Brian Renz. So here we have uh, Bible structure. Now, uh, admittedly, in some of these, uh, there may be some mystery. I don't fully understand, as I preached in a recent sermon, all that Paul's talking about uh, when he says they'll be saved in childbearing. I don't fully comprehend all he's saying. Uh, I know, I'm not sure all that he means, but he means something. Is this correct? He does mean something. And, uh, for instance, this uh, J. Lee Grady, who wrote Ten Lies, The Church is Telling Women, uh, as he, he writes, he, uh, he, he says that as the, uh, as the apostle uh, wrote that, that he's referring to some uh, feminine deity that had invaded the church, uh, and so he's writing to counteract that. But you see, that's not true, because the apostle reaches clear back to creation for his justification and says this is natural law. God made it this way, set this structure into place, and he uses that as the foundation and the basis for what he's going to say. That's how you interpret scripture. If you interpret it all, you don't go out of some, uh, some uh, history book or some commentator. And I'd never read that before, what this uh, man is trying to say, that this is probably what he meant because, no, I think the apostle Paul meant exactly what he said. 
And though I may not comprehend everything that he says there, he does mean something, and he, and he uh, sets a structure into place, and he uses the justification of creation, how God made creation, man and woman, and he uses that as his justification. First Timothy 2, 9 through 15. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived found into transgression. Now, those two statements have profound impact. They mean something. They mean the whole argument of what the, Paul, uh, the apostle is talking about. And uh, we don't go the uh, Jesus-only role of a woman shouldn't wear lipstick, she shouldn't wear jewelry, she shouldn't uh, fix her hair if she needs to let it grow down to her waist and never... Uh, never cut it and uh, on and on and on. We're not, we're, we're, not, we're not into that. What the apostle is saying is that uh, let, don't let the emphasis be on outside because that's not where the real beauty lies. It lies in, in, the, in, the, in the inner woman, uh, the uh, hidden uh, uh, man of the heart, and let not that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, adornment be emphasized on the outward but put it on the inside. And so uh, most of us have had experiences with uh, Jesus only is in, uh, and their narrowness and uh, uh, if you wear a ring a wedding ring while well, you sinned against God and if you curl your hair why well, uh, you're a bob haired hussy and uh, all the statements they use well uh, most women that I've, uh, that I've seen they could use a little paint on that barn amen Okay, Jake, you're right on. <laughs> and we appreciate women that uh, dress and take care of themselves, look attractive to their husbands and the rest of society. We appreciate that, and uh, we don't agree with those. But what he's saying is that that's not the emphasis, needed to be the emphasis, dress with moderation, uh, and uh, the, the emphasis ought to be on your spiritual condition. That's what he's saying. All right, go ahead, Samantha. Okay, he talks about, I preached a sermon recently about that, that I'm not sure all this means, but it does uh, put the emphasis on a woman's role as a homemaker. We do not condemn women who must enter the workforce. In our society, we're dealing increasingly with women that uh, slugs depart from them, desert them, and go to be whoremongers, drug addicts, and whatever, and leave them deserted. We appreciate them, and many of them have done admirable jobs uh, filling in and taking up the slack and we appreciate that and uh, however that's not God's plan okay so let's have uh, 1 Corinthians 14 34 and 35 okay what, what uh, uh, Paul many commentators say what he's dealing with is that uh, in biblical times men and women did not sit together they sat separated women on one side men on the other and what was happening in the, in the dynamics of the service is that Susie was shouting across to Joe, Joe, what, what does that mean? He was giving an explanation and it's creating chaos in the church. And this is what he's dealing with, says if you want to uh, ask your husband, where do you get home? Then you do that. And so many commentators uh, uh, bring us that insight and say that's it. If you, can, if you travel into any of the synagogues in the Middle East, you, they'll clearly point out the different sections. This is where men sit, this is where women sit. They did not sit together. Uh, Titus 2, 3 through 5. Be reverent in behavior. All right, here is, he's uh, homing in on uh, women, active women, women of God. Uh, here's the uh, statement of the apostle. He's emphasizing uh, that women have a valuable role. Uh, the most valuable role they have is as an example to and instruction for uh, younger women. How many of you younger women have ever asked an older woman uh, about a, a problem with your children? Two of you? This is not a trick question. What about... Uh, 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 Sister Mitchell gets calls all the time and has all, all of her life of, uh, you know, my child is... Uh, uh, this this kind of fever, that kind of uh, sickness, or that kind of rash, or this. What 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 should I do about it? And she gets questions all the time about that. And uh, many many women uh, are valuable in the body of Jesus Christ in bringing out the uh, facets of need uh, of uh, actually mentoring or discipling younger women in the church by their role, by their words, and by their deeds. First Peter three five and six. 
Every man in this building heard that worse, calling Abraham Lord. <laughs> Lots of luck. <laughs> okay. Uh, here's a pastor that's done a little shot. I'm not sure. All, he just sent me a quote. And... Uh, uh, and so he, he, he makes this comment. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 3 talks about the structure of headship. So this is not a dominating, insensitive, abusive, foot stomping, men shouting submit, but the environment that the man creates in his home. The three areas of covering. The man must cover emotionally. Women are more emotionally charged than men. They tend to function and respond emotionally rather than logically. How many of you women know that? You respond emotionally. Men respond logically. Men and women are not the same. I don't care who writes what book. Uh, men and women are not the same. They're not an accident of their environment. That uh, here, here, uh, uh, here, because of the traditional traditional roles that our society has imposed on them, that men act this way and women act that way. They act this way because they are that way. There's no mystery of any kind. And uh, it's been proven out by science, science, uh, society, and someone no doubt uh, has read the quotes on this. And so a, a woman's emotions must be covered. A man must surround and provide uh, limitations. They indulge their anger, their pity, their sorrow. They fuel it and fan the flames. Yes, they do. You might as well not. They really do. And so uh, the husband has a right to uh, bring balance to this, some kind of logic. And so rather than say, as his wife is raging and carrying on, that's right, dear, you have a right to be mad. Well, if you're, you've got a, a bad road ahead of you. Ahab knew that Elijah was a man of God. Jezebel goes into a rage. She seeks revenge. Ahab does not stop her. He doesn't put a clamp on her emotions. Ahab goes into a pity trip. He's discouraged. His wife is wound up and Naboth dies protecting his destiny. And the formula that we have is an emotional wife linked to a spineless husband spells a dead destiny. That story's in the Old Testament. So let's open it up and, uh, and see what kind of rage we've triggered this morning. <laughs> Pete Walter. <laughs> Real loud for me, Pete. <laughs> it's a deep theological question. It wasn't an apple, it was a pear. <laughs> You've been reading too many books. We don't know what it was. I'm just, uh, there was absolutely a, uh, uh, and so one of this uh, magazine uh, author, editor, uh, that one of the things he says is that women are not more spiritually susceptible to deception than men. Well, he's not pastored, I can tell you for sure. This is not to put women down. They are, as I've said before, they're much smarter than men. You don't like that. They are. They're sensitive. They have, a, they have an intuition uh, that is almost infallible. They can spot and they sense an immoral man without any actions of any kind. Intuitively, they know. They're sharp as a tack. They have a spiritual sensitivity, uh, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, very apparent. And, uh, and it's a wonderful thing. There's no, there's no problem with that. The difficulty is, if that is not sheltered and brought into, uh, uh, into uh, control by uh, uh, protection, they are easily deceived because of the very faculties there are, and, uh, and, and uh, this, is, this is what you're saying, Pete. I don't know that we'd still be in the garden, but things would be a lot different. Right. Yes. Yep. Yeah, it's very interesting that Paul says, he makes that statement, and you can throw it in the trash, you can get mad at me that I'm a male chauvinist pig, I'm a sexist, you can do all that, but you see, Paul says something there, and what he says was, for the woman was deceived, and she was in the transgression. For, see, the for means something. Bear Montgomery, real loud for me. 
It's called sentimentalism. Most music today and a great deal of ministry is sentimentalism. Is what it is. It's sentimental. It has an emotional content, and it, you're exactly right because the music plays it out. And we are not making love to Jesus when we worship. True worship is responding to who God is. And if you read the Psalms, as Bear says, you'll find out who He is. He breaks the teeth out of people and uh, all kinds of stuff. I mean, it's, it, it, it's a, do you have something else to say? Yeah, I, I read the Psalms a lot, and he loves God. Yes. And then love comes out, but it's always tempered with the fear of God. But it's not with sexual overtones, no. and it's not sentimentalism. No, and it's, and it's rooted in who God is, not just Who God is, and, and, and it makes you feel like a man when you get through reading him. Uh, is it uh, Victor? All right, government study, uh, astounding. That probably cost about $20 million. They discovered that men and women are emphatically different. What a revelation. Uh, yeah, Nick. Uh, there's a woman in his high school reunion last month. A woman used to be in this church was at that. And I guess when she was in Tennessee. So now she's turned up to be a pastor back in Tennessee. Co-pastoring with her husband. Co-pastoring with her husband. Does worldwide conferences for women. She's as batty as, as, as anybody he's ever met. Why would you say that? She's a wing net. Let's hear from the women. Carol? All right, Carol's worked in preschool 24 years. When she began, she was under the delusion that little boys and little girls were the same. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. You give a little boy a pillow, a nice fluffy pillow, it becomes a bomb. <laughs> if you give a little girl a pillow, she becomes a little baby. It's always the case. And there definitely is a difference between boys and girls. And uh, we have Gail. Yes, this is verse 15 of First Timothy 2. As she submits herself to the maternal spirit, which is what a mother and a housekeeper is. Because she aligns herself, all the things she wants will come to pass. Yeah. Yes. Yes. This is what I would have been. I wrote you, read you a quote about uh, Jermaine Greer, who now would like to have a baby. It's too late. Uh, uh, the, uh, the clock has run out. Uh, Jeannie? When Jeannie grew up, she, uh, her family, she grew up, she's the only girl, and the family said, get out there and, uh, and conquer the world. Right. All right. Jeannie's hated uh, a wood star a burning stove. Joel wouldn't buy her anything else. <laughs> And so one day she's home alone with the kids and it's cold. Go ahead. Suddenly uh, she heard God's voice speak to her and say, you don't have to do it all. Uh, and so that liberated her uh, to be a woman, submit to her husband. And uh, did he buy you another stove? <laughs> I was counseling. I was counseling a woman some years ago. And uh, so, uh, you know, she's, she's one of these women that uh, she wants everything. I mean, I want everything. I said, uh, and her husband, he's resisting this. You know, uh, uh, he's, he's not caving into this. Every whim that she wants and she, her desires are endless. And so I said to her, dear, uh, that man will give you anything that you want, but you won't get it by demanding it. You have to learn to maneuver. <laughs> You can get anything. He'll give you anything that you want, but he will not get it by you standing up and demanding you're going to do this because that instinctively is an assault to the male ego, and he will resist that even if it's right. So, having said that, I escaped off into the sermon hour. <laughs>